Welcome to the Marketing Pulpit Show, and I am Robert Gatewood, your host. We are here every Friday at 10.30 a.m., bringing you the good of marketing gospel. We're not saving souls, we're saving businesses, saving jobs, saving our community. Now, if I happen to save a soul along the way, don't hold that against me. We'll just call that icing on the cake. Now, the mission at Marketing Pulpit Show is to build strong businesses in our community so that we can put our people to work. And we do that with business development, job creation, and service. So if you ever find yourself in a business crossroads and not sure which way to turn, just turn on the Marketing Corporate Show because we are on a mission. You can also find this show on the major platforms like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and you can find it at Welcome to the Marketing Pulpit Show, and I'm Robert Gatewood, your host, and we are here every Friday at 10.30 a.m. bringing you the good marketing gospel. We're not saving souls. We're saving businesses, saving jobs, saving our community. Now, if you ever find, if you ever find yourself in a business crossroads and not sure which way to turn, hey, just turn on the Marketing Pulpit Show. That's right. We're not saving souls. We're saving businesses. But you know what? If I happen to save a soul along the way, don't hold that against me. We'll just call that icing on the cake. Because my dad was a minister now. Sometimes that some of that stuff rubbed off on me. But he was in a different ministry. He was saving souls. I'm out here trying to save some businesses so we can get these businesses rolling and build that economic foundation in our community. I am so tired. So tired of us dragging our kids over to other folks' community, looking for work. When we have all of this talent, all of these resources right here in our community, my job is to help hone it extract it, nurture it, and build it into some successful businesses so we can put our people to work. I'd like to join everybody. Welcome everybody who's joining us for the first time. Uh, we have been at this now for about 13 years. Wow, that's a long time. And we are broadcast all over the entire world. You can catch the show on Facebook, on YouTube, on LinkedIn, and on Twitter. And you can catch us on Radio 1 at 95.9 FM radio dial on most Fridays. Uh, got an exciting show lined up for today. We're going to talk about some things. We're still into uh, Black History Month, and that is so important to the people who are under the sound of my voice, regardless if you are Black if, or if you're a business or whatever you are. You could be any persuasion, and you may or may not own a business. But it is important on this particular month that we understand some of the significance uh, the significance of some of the things that have happened before and how we can go forward in a very positive way. Uh, if you want to join the conversation, you can actually go to uh, Facebook and just drop your comments in the feed and we will recognize you. We got people tuning in here. I see Brother Brown, the greatest plumber in town. Good morning, Brother Brown. Glad to see you this morning. Good morning, uh, Bernie Jones uh, and Gerald Brown. <laughs> All right, glad you guys joined us this morning. And so we'll be putting your comments up as you tune in today. Uh, we're going to have a special guest coming up later on also, Minister Curtis Gatewood out of North Carolina. He's going to add a little context and perspective and try to bridge that gap between what we've been through as a black community on this Black History Month and where we are now. And so we bring, we'll be lucky, we'll be uh, fortunate to have him to join us later on. And also we're going to talk about later on in the show. It takes more than customers to succeed in business. I know some of y'all are saying, what are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> if I get all the customers in the world, do I need anything else? Well, I'm going to tell you, yes, you do. So later in the show, my marketing sermon is going to talk about why you need more than customers to be a successful business owner and what those other ingredients are when it comes to building that successful business so you don't want to miss that part of the show. So welcome, everybody, and thank you again for tuning in to the Marketing Pulpit Show. Um, let's see. Also, like I said, if you're going to um, find out more about the show, go to Marketing Pulpit. You can watch the show right on the screen. You don't even have to have Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever those tools. We have the show being broadcast live right on the homepage of Marketing Pulpit. But I do want you to go to our YouTube channel 
and subscribe. And you can get snippets there. You can get uh, do a search on certain topics relating to marketing and business and technology and so forth. So you want to take advantage of that, too. So go ahead and join, subscribe to the Marketing Pulpit on uh, YouTube. I'll tell you what, though. i got to tell you a little story. got to tell you a little story. i got to tell you a story. I'll do my Bernie Mac. got to tell you a story. Tell you a story this morning. Tell you a story. I was actually uh, driving yesterday. I was going over to the DMV in Maryland. And um, I, have to do, have, I get the vehicle, vehicle admission inspection. You have to do that about every couple of years. So I'm driving down the road. And I kind of, I wasn't exactly sure where it was because you only go there like, you know, about what, twice a year. So it wasn't like on my radar on a regular basis. So I'm driving along. And so I made an early turn. You know, sometimes you make the turn, but you see that sign that says it has an arrow, but they really mean the next street. So I made this turn and I'm driving down the street and I also need some gas. So I pulled into the uh, parking lot of this gas station. I'm assuming, since I've seen signs all day long, that gas is going to be about $3.11 a gallon. So I pull up there. I'm kind of preoccupied trying to figure out how to get to this DMV. And so I'm just pumping gas. And I kept seeing the pump. I mean, it, that, that dollar thing just kept going. I said, wait a minute. This thing is past 40 bucks. What's going on here? And so I happened to just look down at the pump. And the price on the pump was $3.62 a gallon. And I've been seeing signs all day long the day before that gas should be $3.11 a gallon. So I said, what in the heck is going on here? So anyway, well, I'm already there now, right? So I look up. I said, well, they got me. So I got back in my car, and I have an attitude now. I'm in a tizzy. So I'm driving down the street. And as I'm driving, I felt my car kind of shifting and sliding over into the victimhood. That's right, folks. There is such a thing as the victimhood. Now, if you're not sure what the victimhood is, it's a it's a mental condition. Okay, it's a mental place where you're in the constant attack by sinister forces, real and imagined. And so I found myself on this particular day, car being drifted over into the victimhood. Now, when you put that "the" in front of it, we're talking about a place. Okay. In this victimhood, you are constantly under stress. You have your psychic energy is being drawn out of you at all times when you are in the victimhood, okay? In the victimhood, we take things for granted that are normally easy to ascertain, like peace of mind, credibility, uh, all types of education opportunities. When we're in the victimhood, those things tend to cost a little more. So I'm finding myself drifting over into this victimhood. Now, the, another thing about this place called the victimhood, they're very myopic. People in the victimhood, they want to keep you there too. Once you get in that victimhood, you never want to get out. So I'm driving along because I didn't get the gas at $3 a gallon. I found myself being drifted over into the victimhood. Now, one thing about the victimhood this is one of the few places on earth where there's no discrimination. Anybody can get into the victimhood. You see disgraced billionaire politicians co-mingling with uh, the undereducated and the unemployed. Because in the victimhood, if you have a gripe, the gates are wide open for anybody who wants to enter. So, yes, there is a case, there will cases be that will arise where you have been wronged by a person or in an institution. But whatever you do, don't let yourself get over into the victimhood. What you want to do is join the forces that are proactive, forward thinking, problem solvers, who are putting who are covering the potholes of life and setting out the warning flares to keep the rest of us, the rest of the world from becoming victims. That's the hood you want to be in, not the victimhood, okay? So what I want you to do today, if you ever find yourself, and we all, myself, we've all been victims at one time or another, but don't, whatever you do, wind up in the victimhood. That's a better place. If you ever find yourself there, make a U-turn, pack up, move, get out here with the good people who are doing things that are positive. I'd like to welcome a lot of other folks coming in, joining Brother Rory down in the Carolina. Thank you for joining us this morning. 
Sister Hopkins, Linda, one of my classmates from the Stone, welcome. For, thank you for joining us this morning. Who else we got joining us here? Uh, so thank you, everybody, for tuning in this morning. We're going to take a quick break. We are doing an extended show today. We, we're going to get beyond our half hour because we have so much to talk about. We want to get uh, Brother Gatewood, Brother Curtis Gatewood coming up after the break. We're going to bring back war in the workplace. Boy, let me tell you. During that pandemic, people lost their ever-loving mind. And so what we did, we created a segment. We said, this is not normal. So, and what happens, we had stakeholders, customers turning on, on the uh, store owners. People are having road rage on the side of the street. Crazy things that are going on. And we thought we could even, we could even put the uh, war in the workplace aside for a minute. But we had to dig it back up because so many strange things are happening so we brought war in the workplace back, and you don't want to miss that segment coming up today. So we're gonna so we got that going on. We got Minister Curtis Gatewood coming up. We have our war in the workplace, and we have our marketing sermon. You don't <laughs> you need more than customers to succeed in business. So we're gonna take a quick break. So hang on a second. This is the marketing pulpit show. I'm Robert Gatewood, your host. We are here every Friday at 10:30 a.m. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back in a moment. All right, boy, we have a packed house today. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in all over the world. And we're just glad to have you on the marketing pulpit this morning. I'm Robert Gatewood, your host. I am a business developer by trade. I have a company called Gatewood Marketing and Web. You can find me at gatewoodmarketing.com. I'm also an adjunct professor at Prince George's Community College in the Washington, D.C. area, where I teach courses on marketing, on social media, and networking. And we just recently uh, have an agreement to, I'll be, lecturing over at the National Harbor at Employ Prince George's. So we've got to get this information out here. I'm also an author. I have two books, one called Played in Full and one called Smarter Than the Boss. And I'm also a uh, consultant with the Small Business Administration where we help people in the 8A program. So yeah, got a couple of receipts, but it's not to brag, but to let people know that you got to get this information and it's available right here on this platform at no cost to you, at least for now. Coming up, though, we're going to be opening. We're going to reopen the marketing pulpit business directory next month. So you guys might as well start getting your little, getting yourselves ready to get into the directory, because you know what happens. I'm recommending people to clients, listeners every day, and I'm getting tired and hoarse. So what I'm going to start doing is say, look, go to the marketing pulpit business directory, and you will find not only their name but their contact information, their web address, their social media platform. So start getting your information together because we're going to be launching that coming up in March. So we got there's always something going on at the marketing pulpit. And thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. Good morning, Platinum. Platinum is a, a an amazing comedian. Glad to have her joining us this morning. And everybody else who's tuning in to the marketing pulpit show, go to marketingpulpit.com to find out more about the show. You can also find out about, about my company at Gatewood Marketing. Also, coming up next week, BLE, one of our Pivotal um, sponsors, they're having their first Friday networking event coming up on March 3rd. And if you're in the Washington, D.C. area or not, 
drive, if you're not even watching the area, watching DC area, work the drive to come up and join this networking event. Uh, Sister Bernadette Clay, she is the owner of the BLE Executive Suites. They have the three locations, one in National Harbor, one in Lago, where we broadcast in the show, and one over in College Park, which is a hub zone, which is great for government contractors. She's going to be talking about faith in business. This is a very spiritual sister. She talks about the law of attraction, the faith muscle. She's been a guest on this show. And we're having the first Friday networking event next week at uh, 1130 to 1 o'clock. I will be there. I'll be emceeing and, of course, dropping a few nuggets myself. But you want to catch Sister Bernadette Clay. She's going to show you how she did it. Built this, com this company from nothing. And now she has three locations and heaven knows how many companies she has helped launch. She's going to be the featured uh, guest. So go to marketingpulpit.com. There is a banner on the right side. Click that banner and guess what? If you come from the Marketing Pulpit link, it's absolutely free to you. No cost to you. So come on over to it. I'll be there and you may see me coming in and out. So some of you folks I've met for the first time at these events. So come on out. Join us at the Marketing Pulpit first Friday uh, with BLE Executive Suites. And um, we'll be glad to see you at the event. Uh, we're going to bring in our special guest. And later in the show, we're going to talk about you need more than, than customers to succeed in business. Every time I say that, people look at me like I'm crazy. So look, Gate, would you tell me now all this work I'm doing? I got a million customers. But well, what if you got a million customers, but you don't have any product? <laughs> know what I mean? So anyway, we're going to talk about that coming up in a moment. Let's bring in our special guest. Let me bring him in. But Minister Curtis Gatewood. Minister Curtis Gatewood, welcome to the Marketing Pulpit Show. Robert, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. I've been enjoying your show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Curtis, I was uh, looking at your bio. It is so extensive. And i tell you something else I noticed, too. You're a busy young man. I was looking at your schedule. You you have this show today. You have to go up to Raleigh or Durham somewhere to right. do a speech. You got to be down in Waysburg, North Carolina later on. So I'm just glad that we were able to grab just a few minutes of your time this morning before you have to get on the road. But do this, Curtis. And I know, like I said, I, I read your bio, but nobody can tell your story like you. Tell us, just give us a quick bio. I know you've, you've had the eight, you're noted for the HK, HJ on K down in Durham where you guys had like 75,000 people out in front of people and become one of the biggest events in the, uh, in, in the uh, yep. tri-state area. And so I know that, I know you've been one of the youngest NAACP members and presidents in the, in the, uh, in the, in the country. Uh, so why don't you get, give us a couple of quick highlights before I get into some of these questions. I want to pick your brain a minute on this Black History Month. Yeah, well, thank you again. And, and it is an honor. I do love my he people. I love my history. And it is great to hear you talking about the businesses that, of course, serves as the business business that serves as the engine of the Black community. Uh, Robert, I want to say this before we get started. You know, it is amazing that some of us seem to think that we can fly into the land of freedom without the wings of economic uh, sustainability and, and the Black Business Foundation. Uh, that we're only fooling ourselves by thinking that we can do this because one of the main things that allowed oppression to be uh, as effective is we were stripped of our businesses, we were stripped of our income, and therefore. It is imperative that we listen to uh, the marketing pulpit and what you bring to the table. Uh, again, I, I'm, of course, your brother. <laughs> we talk about history, 14 children. You know, you're one of the siblings. I'm the 12th child of the 14. I'm the knee, knee baby. Uh, so we come out of uh, humble beginnings. Um, of course, I moved to Durham in 1988, where I met my beautiful, uh, uh, married my beautiful wife, Odessa Burnett Gatewood. And of course, we've been married now for 34 years. I don't know how a person 34 years old can be married 34 years, but hey, <laughs> you do the math. But in any event, we are mm. thankful. <laughs> but, we are, Go ahead, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but we are thankful for this day. Um, uh, Robert, you know, the thing about it, and I would like to talk about my ministry, which put me down really into the middle of a lot of this, because, you know, there is this word that says we've come this far by faith, Robert. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of my things is that in order for us to preserve the black future, we must use black history in a way that will help us to learn 
and not just learn dates and 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 people's names, but we have to use that information to preserve the black future. And one of the things that come out of our communities is that we've come this far by faith. If we really believe we came this far by faith, then why did we lose our faith? You know, mm. why is it now that we seem not to care about faith? Uh, my father, as you always mentioned, was a very religious man. My mother uh, was a very religious woman. If we didn't go to church, uh, we were going to have church at home. You mm -hmm. know, those types of things. And you remember that. And so by going into Durham, North Carolina, meeting my beautiful wife, my religious faith drove me to believe that I could go anywhere into the most dangerous situations, into the drug and face the communities, into the places where people are most troubled. It is through that faith that I felt I had the courage to do so. So one of the things that I, as a part of my ministry, uh, and I informed my pastor at the time, that I didn't want to do my trial sermon in a regular church. I wanted to do it in the most drug infested community in Durham. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do it in the most violent community because I felt that's where God was calling me. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, I ended up doing my trial sermon. A lot of people don't know this. I actually requested that I do it in the most drug infested and crime infested community, not in the comforts of the regular traditional church. And out of that beginning, Robert, is where I think I felt uh, obligated to do more for the community because shortly after my trial sermon, a two-year-old by the name of Chaquana Atwater was killed uh, in the crossfire of a drive-by. Mm. And it is and it's that killing that drove me uh, to spearhead one of the largest marches of black men against street violence in the history of Durham. And, mm. and, and it was out of that ministry where I felt that becoming an NAACP leader or, or, or using whatever platform or vehicle that God would provide was essential. And so I saw the NAACP at that time as a platform that would allow, that was already uh, had an infrastructure. And so if we could get to that platform and let people know that there is hope, that there are ways that we can do this, but we're going to break tradition. We started taking NAACP meetings into the public housing community. We started taking NAACP meetings into the homeless shelters. We started taking uh, on issues like out-of-school suspensions and, and becoming permanent fixtures at school board meetings. Uh, we were not going to believe that a zero-tolerance policy should be in the Curtis, your screen is frozen. I've been given so little, expected to do so much and have zero tolerance for them. So it was those types of things that I believe uh, helped me to become uh, one of the respected leaders around the state. And of course, it propelled me not because of my greatness or anything like that. Uh, again, we came through humble beginnings, but I really believe, uh, I, I believe that putting in motion what I've learned through black history, faith. And one last thing before I turn it over to you, I am suggesting that we stop calling ourselves the hood <laughs> because if we're going to say we've come this far by faith, we must remember the greatest commandment that Jesus talked about. And the greatest commandment is that we must love God with all our heart, mind, and soul and love our neighbor as ourselves. So I'm suggesting that we put neighbor back into the hood so that we can have a neighborhood that love ye one another and that we can rebuild that village that it takes to raise one child. Well, I'm glad to hear you say the hood because I've been on a hood thing myself. Get us out of the victim <laughs> hood we, <laughs> because it's not a good place to be. We have work to do. We don't have time to be hanging around in hoods and we got things to do. Uh, now, I, and I, I will acknowledge this and, and really give utmost respect for the fact that you did you didn't, like many people who call themselves leaders, they go into the, the ivory towers and the, you started down in the, in the trenches. And another thing I heard you say today that was, I thought was important, is that you talked about this drive-by. There, you have to fight violence. You have to fight dysfunction wherever it comes from, whether it's the police beating you over the head or whether it's some kid out here carjacking. You can't Absolutely. say because, well, that person looks like me or that when you're dead, you're dead. It doesn't matter whether it was a drive-by or the police did it. So I like your holistic approach. 
and we're not minimizing anything from the brutality that we a lot of times young black people find themselves at the hands of but at the same time we have to realize that we have to fight uh, uh, evil within and without and that has been one of the i think one of the um, uh, degrees of separation that i've noticed with you that you fight your organization stop killing us you want people to stop killing us whoever you are tell us a little bit tell us quickly about your organization yes uh robert it was during august 20 28th of 2017 that our nonprofit justice administration which is the acronym jesus uniting souls to increase community engagement uh kick off stop killing us solution campaign we did it deliberately at the time of the commemoration of the march on washington 1963 march on washington which took place august 28 1963 uh on, on 2017 we unveiled stop killing a solution campaign uh for for specific reasons as you for as for mentioned um one of the reasons is that we're being killed by everybody robert <laughs> we're not just being killed we uh See, the thing about it is we have to have honesty in our movements um, and we can't have double standards. And, and, and what we should do as people who are of a noble ancestry is be the example of integrity and ensuring that whatever we do, we apply it across the board. I think one of the greatest tragedies of the movement is that, and I think we totally underestimate the damage of self-hatred and the and the and the acts of detriment that come from black other black people. So what we need to do is just be honest. And first of all, we do understand a lot of the self hatred is a a symptom a symptom of white supremacy, the larger disease. Uh, oftentimes we confuse the, the the symptoms with the disease. So uh, there's so much killing around the, a nation, Robert. Uh, we so therefore the Stop Killing Us Solution campaign. Uh, we felt that we could address police misconduct and we can address community violence or violence from racist uh, terrorist groups such as the KKK, uh, the skinheads, neo-Nazis, Confederate super sympathizers and others uh, because it takes all of this to preserve life. And the goal is to preserve black life. And as you stated, that a bullet coming out of a gun, if it kills a little two-year-old girl, uh, it didn't matter. It didn't matter to me where it came from. I'm going to fight that gun holder. I'm going to fight that disease, and I'm going to stand up and say so. And I'm not going to be afraid that somebody's going to say, "Well, we need to be looking at the white man," or, the, or when we speak about the white man, you need to be looking at the black man. Or no, we're going to say whenever there's an injustice, and Dr. King said it best: a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. A threat to justice anywhere. So a threat to violence anywhere is a threat to violence everywhere. And therefore, we must stand up in the Stop Killing a Solution campaign. One of the things we did as we unveiled the Stop Killing a Solution campaign is we came with solutions, Robert, which I would not probably have a lot of time to go into today. But one of the main things we did with the Stop Killing a Solution campaign is said we want to know what we can do to make sure police officers stop doing what they are doing across this country. And we gave up, came with about an 18 point plan. Much of the plan is centered around the constitutionality that already exists. In other words, we are not allowing, we have a lawless form of law enforcement. In other words, the police officers are not following the law. They're not honoring the Fourth Amendment, making sure that they have the right to search before they search. They're not honoring the Fourth or the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, which requires due process, uh, equal protection under the law. They're not doing this. They're just coming in, uh, shooting first, asking questions later. And so the Stop Killing Us Solution campaign, actually, we are more in a position to have a standard higher than that of the so-called law enforcement that we have today. The law enforcement that we have today is inferior, is savage, it's below the standard of the universal, um, the universal uh, human rights uh, that we know about international law. It's below the Constitution's standards. So therefore, Stop Killing a Solution campaign, we use our, the same law that's already been put in place to say to America, you're not following your own laws. I can't hear you. I lost your sound.
Okay, how about that? Now I hear you. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, in the interest of time, I would like to, uh, in the end, have you give out information on how people can find out more about and get the entire platform for the SKU campaign. Absolutely. I'm sure many of the listening audience would like to get the entire story. And um, as one quick uh, more question before we get out of here. Um, now, we're in the, uh, in the history of, uh, like I say, Black History Month, and we have a, we've had a very uh, interesting past when it comes to economic uh, survival of the Black business community. Many people say, look, we should just focus on economics. We should focus on building the better mousetrap, marketing, so forth. But somehow, some way, we found out time and time again that that has not been enough because of other things that have been going on around us. Briefly touch, touch on some of the historical examples of where uh, Black businesses have actually been thriving at one time, but somehow we found ourselves back at the bottom of the totem pole. Why don't you break that down for us? Yeah, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because if we look at what happened post-slavery, that is why, again, Rob, I'm also an advocate for not only black business, I'm an advocate for reparations and everything, and in any way where black people can, again, find economic sustainability. But during 1898, for example, right here in North Carolina, Robert, uh, you had the Wilmington massacre, the first coup d'etat on the only coup d'etat to ever take place. You had black people there who were doing well with business. They were uh, involved in, in the political process. They were elected officials. They had a major black newspaper. It was all destroyed in 1898 because of the success of because of the success of blacks and the jealousy of white men. Uh, they they the KKK and others came together and ran the black uh, elected officials out of office, in, including some of the whites who supported the black officials. They ran them out of office violently, ran them out into the woods, those that they didn't kill, took the property, took the uh, took over, violently took over the governmental process after black folk had actually gotten out the vote. In fact, they took the day before, they said any person who came out to vote, it was going to be a death note. And so... That's one way where you had a successful town right here in Wilmington sitting right there at the bay and would, and black folk would just run out, land taken, the businesses taken. Another uh, place that we should always remember, although there's Rosewood, there's Elaine, there are so many other examples of this, Robert. Uh, Tulsa, 1929, May 31st. Uh, there you had... <laughs> The, you know how you how when they put up that sign when they had 9-11 said we will never forget. It's interesting how the Tulsa massacre has been not only forgotten, but seldom told. And but in 1921, there was actually a bomb dropped on Tulsa in addition to uh, a, a mass of shooters coming in, killing black people based on a rumor about some uh, some event that took place earlier that the, the following day. Uh, but businesses, again, black folk businesses known as the Wall, Black Wall Street, businesses taken over, destroyed, people run out of town, murdered by the masses. Again, where black folk had pulled themselves up where there wasn't even bootstraps, but they pulled themselves up. And again, they were robbed again, in addition to the slavery that had already taken place. And I could go on the Black Wall Street in Durham while they did not use violence. But there are several uh, instances around the nation where laws were used uh, to run black businesses out uh, by the masses, with, such as the so-called urban renewal, which people refer to as urban removal. Right. So Curtis, this, this, I mean, what, the reason I, I, I ask you to bring this up, because uh, black businesses do have some unique challenges. And also, I keep reminding people on this show that we don't operate in a vacuum. Absolutely. We still have to go out here and vote. We still Absolutely. have to go out here and be engaged in the community. As a matter of fact, my sermon coming up later on, we're going to be talking about why just going out and getting customers alone is not enough. And one of those areas that we have to be involved in is uh, Wash It All Group Sustainability Projects. These are things that we might not affect our direct customer trajectory, but when you take them in their totality, they can have a, a traumatic impact on the success of your business and how long and whether you're going to be able to pass that business down to the next generation, whether it's going to be affected by redlining, whether it's going to be affected by people who Absolutely. are elected, who have a, a disdain 
for certain people. So you cannot just say, well, I'm only going to go out here and make some money and things are going to be all right. <laughs> Tulsa, Rosewood, Wilmington have proven the opposite is true. So we have to be engaged as a community. And this is not to say go out here and say, look, well, all, all people of a certain race are bad. Because like you said, in Wilmington, they ran black people and white people alike out of the city. Anybody yeah. who was in favor of justice, they were yeah. treated the same. Absolutely. So we have to throw out a big net for all the goodwill people, people who are believe in justice and not just justice for one group or one or the, or the other, but justice indeed is colorblind, even though in sometimes in this country, we don't think it is, but it should be. And Absolutely. So glad you brought that point up. And uh, what I like to do, Curtis, is let people know how they can find out more about you. I know we, we have your bio at curtisgatewood.com if somebody wants to go ahead and find out more about you. And I understand your, your speaking uh, requests have been coming in right and left. So if somebody wants to get this brother on their schedule, then yeah. go to that website. But Curtis, uh, give us some parting words on how people might uh, reach you and any other parting words you'd like to leave us with. Yeah, first of all, uh, call me, 919-939-6311. I'm approachable. And that's mm -hmm. one been our claim to fame. We, we have too many so-called activists and civil rights leaders who think you can leave from behind a desk. Uh, so call me, 919-939-6311. And you'll get me. And if and if I can't call you back or talk to you at the time, I will return your call. Just let me know why you called. Uh, next of all, if you want to send me an email, send it. My email address has always been easy. Gatewood loves L O V E S justice at gmail.com. Uh, feel free to shoot me an email. As you said, CurtisGatewood.com will send you to my bio. But of course, I'm on Facebook, Curtis Everett Gatewood. I'm on Facebook. I have a serious Facebook uh, presence. And uh, of course, so is the Stop Killing Us Solution campaign on Facebook. Justice Administration is on Facebook and other uh, social media uh, platforms. So again, feel free to call me. And, and before I leave, I would like to say, Robert, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for what uh, is going on. And again, I want to leave with the idea that we must fight both battles. We are attacked by a double barrel shotgun from white supremacy, black self-hatred. Of course, black self-hatred is ultimately a part of or a symptom of, but we never must underestimate either or. Because when we do, when we take our eyes off either ball or either challenge or either threat, that is when we become most vulnerable. And that is something that history should have taught us by now. Curtis Gatewood, thank you, brother. Uh, I'll see you next time in, in uh, when I'm in Carolina. Also, uh, Curtis and I and the other brothers, we've been we've dusted off our, our vocal calls lately. The Gatewood <laughs> brothers have done a couple of appearances. And so we've been glad to get together with you and the other brothers. You can find out more about the Gatewood brothers at, uh, uh, on Facebook as well and at gatewoodbrothers.com. Yes, sir. I just want to say one more thing. They denied us because they could divide us. They lied to us. But now God is beside us to guide us, to demand jobs, justice, education under one God but a divided nation. Thank you, brother. Brother, that's, uh, that's Curtis <laughs> Gate with ladies and gentlemen. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about war in the workplace. We're also going to talk about why you need more than customers to succeed in business. This is the Marketing Pulpit. We'll be right back in a moment. Thank you again, Reverend Curtis Gatewood, and this is the Marketing Pulpit. I'm Robert Gatewood, your host, and we are here every Friday at 10.30 a.m. bringing you the good marketing gospel. Got a couple of quick items in the news, because we have been talking about war in the workplace for the last couple of years since this pandemic. I think people lost their ever-loving minds during this, uh, this pandemic. In this story, a woman fatally shot another person in the head in a parking lot 
in front of some kids over a spat over right of way in the parking lot. Now this happened just recently down in South Carolina. The victim was loading her vehicle, got into a spat. One person pulled out a gun and shot the other person in the back of the head. Folks, this, this gun violence in our country, it is an epidemic. It is a scourge. And we know with these Second Amendment people, we know what they're actually trying to do. You're not fooling anybody. This has nothing to do with the Second Amendment. And we know why the gun laws were put in place in the first place. But it's backfiring on everybody. Nobody's winning from this abundance of guns in our community. A Florida woman waved a loaded gun at a McDonald's drive through because she didn't get her free cookie. I must admit, those, those are some pretty good cookies. I mean, I mean if, if you want that, if you, went, if you went there to get that chocolate chip cookie and they didn't give you a cookie, I mean, but look, let me stop you. There is never an excuse to pull a gun at a drive through because you didn't get a free cookie. Once again, when you look at the root of many of these problems, let's not, not talk about the root, let's talk about one of these consequences. Gun play is usually involved. I'm just going to keep going here because I'm telling you, folks, we have so far to go. Um, in Philadelphia, a suspect shot the grocery manager in the face over a can of gravy. Come on, folks. Say this ain't so. Say this ain't so. On Facebook, and I tell you, boy, sometimes I think that social media is, the, <laughs> is, is from down below. A white man refused to sell his Dodge Charger to a black man, telling him he doesn't sell to his kind. Now, one thing I learned, uh, I've learned over the years, and I was glad to hear Brother Gatewood bring up some of the things that he was bringing about, because we've been talking about what's happening down in the, st in the state of Florida, where, and, and Ron DeSantis is just really the poster boy of what's happening on a larger scale in this country. Now, think about this. Let me tell you about what is called a conflict of interest. Let me tell you what is called an ultimate power move. You create, you go out and create havoc. And then you create a law so that people can't learn about it. Let me repeat that. You go out here, create havoc, abuse people, treat them unjustly, and then you turn around and create a law so that people can't talk about it. Anyway, folks, we're going to use this 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 um, this energy, this momentum that we gathered during Black History Month, and and we're going to move forward with this. Okay, this is not a twenty eight day exercise. This is a big process, and this is not to go out here and try to blame anybody, to shame anybody, but let's just tell the truth. Okay. Let justice reign. All right, we're going to jump into our sermon before we get out of here. And thank you again. This is the Marketing Pulpit. I'm Robert Gatewood, your host. We're going to talk about why you need more than customers to succeed. Now, many of you under the sound of my voice tune into this show because you are a business owner or because you know someone who is in business. And what they tell you in the, in the marketing books and the business development classes, go out here and get some customers and everything will be all right. Get the cost of that customer low as you can. Get the lifetime value as high as it can be. And everything is going to be all right. Well, I hate to say it, but that is important to have those customers. But there's something else that you must have. You must have other stakeholders if you plan to succeed in business. Customers alone will not guarantee you success. Let's imagine you go out and get all the customers you want. You listen to Gatewood, you went out here and did all this amazing marketing. You had your social media humming. You did your uh, your logo and your branding was jumping. You you did all the sales. You had your marketing strategy. But somehow you got all these sales, but let's say you ran out of product. So for one, if that's a vivid example, why you need more than just customers to survive. You also need vendors. You need suppliers to provide the products and services, okay? Also, you got you have all this business, you generate all this interest, but you need employees, you need contractors to facilitate these sales and these transactions. So once again, getting customers 
alone is not going to ensure business success. You need funds. You need partners, people that can lend you money, people that can fund your business. And this whole thing about bootstrapping, I'm going to take a little bit from my paycheck every week, and that's going to fund the business. But what happens in that case, in many cases, particularly in these tech businesses, you're going to face obsolescence. Sometimes you need a cash infusion. Paying, putting $50 here and $200 there a month is not going to do it. You're going to end up facing obsolescence. Your business is going to be gone out of, it's going to be no longer viable by the time you get enough money to reach critical mass. So sometimes you need those funders and you need those partners to help further your mission. We need to deal with the government agencies, okay? We cannot live in a vacuum and assume everything's going to be all right. So as a business owner, we have to deal with government agencies. We have to deal with our community. We have to deal with politicians, nonprofits, environmentalists, watchdog groups, churches, and schools. So the bottom line is you cannot focus solely on customer acquisition and succeed in business. So what do you do about it? Well, when you sit down writing your business plan, your business and marketing strategy, business development, you have to actually make a concerted effort to make sure that these other stakeholders are also part of your acquisition strategy. Okay. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to folks who've gotten into the hair business. Man, they had it all figured out until they realized they couldn't get the products because somebody else had the, the products locked down. Okay. I can't tell you how many folks that went out and got these contracts, but didn't have the contract as employees to facilitate the transaction and the processes. Okay. I can't tell you how many times people have gone out here and they will run up against government regulations because they didn't really didn't understand the business. So you got to organize and you have to go out and get the talent and people who understand how business works. Most people, regardless of your background, understand the sales aspect. Okay, we learned that when we were selling newspapers when we were kids. Lemonade stand, yeah. But even, even a kid running a lemonade stand knows he cannot sell lemonade if he doesn't have lemons, okay? So we as a business have to go out and constantly have our antennas up for these other vital stakeholders. So how do we do that? I'm going to give you the quickest, the quickest way to do that. You have to get out here and network. You have to get out here and rub shoulders with these vital stakeholders, okay? You have to get in the room with them. Running a traditional ad, they might see it, but you need to get that person across the table from you. When you're, in, when you're out here networking, whether it's through a meetup, whether it's through the Chamber of Commerce, whether it's through BNI, whether it's through the BLE, First Friday, you are sitting in the room with the decision makers. Every time I go to a networking event, I am amazed. I said, I can't believe how easy that was. This right here is the person that makes that decision. I didn't have to go through a gatekeeper. I didn't have to run 50 ads. The person is sitting right across from me, sitting right next to me at the table. So, when you do your business plan, your marketing strategy, include those other pivotal stakeholders that are necessary for your success. And one way to do that, I'm going to give you the short, quick answer today, is to get yourself out here. Start networking. And networking doesn't mean you have to join a formal group. You can network at the, in the elevator, handing out your business card. But what you want to do is put yourself in front of decision makers. And that's my marketing sermon for today. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. And thank you for the many people that have tuned in. We had a full house today. Thank you again to uh, Minister Curtis Gatewood. And this show is available on Facebook for, uh, you can replay this show on YouTube. You can play it on Facebook. You can play it on LinkedIn. You can play it on Twitter. And of course, you can always go to marketingpulpit.com where you can catch this show and many other shows. Also, don't forget to, to uh, come on out on next week for the marketing pulpit slash BLE first Friday networking event. Miss Bernadette Clay and her team is going to be there. Miss Clay, she's sponsoring this show and we're just glad to have her as a partner. This goes back to that. Uh, you know, you need more than sales to uh, succeed in business. We happen to be partnered with a company like BLE. We happen to be partnered with a company like Radio One. We have to be partnered with companies of all types so that we can reach those customers and be able to facilitate the process of generating the sales, those transactions, 
and then building that business into a successful operation. So we'll be back next week. Thank you again, everybody, for tuning out. Go to marketingcorporate.com and register for the first Friday networking event coming up next week. There's a button right there on the right-hand side. And I want to thank all the people who are tuning in today. Thank you for the um, compliments and well wishes, platinum, Mr. Rory, and so forth. Glad you all could join us this morning. And we'll be back next week here on the um, Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and over at Radio One. And so we will see you next week. And we're going to be tuning out here. And if you want to be successful, you have to do these three things. Do the right thing. Do it at the right time. And you have to do it right. Enough talk. Let's get to work. school system now who are using critical race theory as the grounds for taking black history out of the school systems. But really what it is, it's a whitewashing of history. Some people are saying, I don't want to tell the history of this country because it makes my kids feel bad. It makes my children feel guilty. But I have a question. What about my darn kids? So you're going to lie and deny the truth, even though it may be damaging, demoralizing my children, not going to happen. So that's why we have to push back. We have to take all the forces that we have, even shows like this that are normally dedicated to business development. We can't sit on the sidelines and let these nefarious forces rule the day. So I'm gonna... all that glitters is not gold. And it simply means that just because something is shiny and pretty doesn't mean that it has value. But there's another side of this coin also that says that all this gold does not necessarily glitter. That means we have people out here right now among us who are doing some phenomenal things, but they don't get the glitter because to them it's more about the purpose. It's more about the results. It's more about helping people. It's more about uplifting. And it's less about shining in the spotlight. So yes, there is some truth to the saying that all the glitters is not gold. But let's not forget also that there are some gold out here that's not glittering. And there are people. They're doing their thing. You can make money while you sleep. It may be an oversimplification in some instances and not so much in others. When we're talking about passive income and making money while you sleep, like most things in life, all things are not created equally. There's some you can make while you totally asleep. You can sleep for a week or two and not even worry about it. Others, you might be jumping up in the middle of the night because things are happening you have to attend to. So you might your sleep might be interrupted. Some you got to do a little work on, some you got to do a lot of work on. So a lot of things have been thrown into that passive income basket. But I do like that concept that um, when I can, I'm laying in the bed at night and I'm making money, that it doesn't mean that I didn't do some work before I lay down. So there are varying degrees of passive income. 